Microplastics and nanoplastics are invisible in our daily lives. They are now found in the water we drink, the food we eat, and even the air we breathe. And studies show that these tiny little plastic particles do end up inside of our bodies, raising some questions about the health impact. Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with his microscope and the important insight into what we know and what we don't know. Let's start with a simple definition. Microplastics are tiny plastic particles or pieces that are less than five millimeters or about the diameter of a pencil eraser. This upper size is actually pretty big and larger microplastic pieces this big aren't generally consumed by humans, but in our environment, they are easily consumed by animals, which means they do make it into our food supply. Also remember, this is the upper size for microplastics and micro and smaller nanoplastics that we ingest inhale and absorb are usually invisible to the naked eye and can be as thin as a DNA strand. Plastics have been found and reported in many humans and many different tissues, including the heart, uh, blood, serum, and even in breast milk. Get a better magnification on that. And Dr. Brian Cummings, Dean of the Eugene Applebaum School of Pharmacology at Wayne State University says it's challenging to know how all this plastic is affecting us. The difficulty there is because they come in so many shapes and so many sizes, there is not one standard method that we can use to rapidly assess and quantify the level that are found in these areas. So that makes it difficult to even assess the amount that gets into our bodies. Which leaves health recommendations lacking. The FDA has found no evidence that plastics or microplastics or nanoplastics found in foodstuffs are causing any adverse health effects. And the CDC has actually supported that, but they also acknowledge that there are gaps in knowledge that we need to address. And to do that, we need to start being able to come up with standardized ways to measure these nanoplastics, to assess their risk, to determine the level of exposure, the levels in the common sources. Even though there is no certainty of harm, there is still reason for concern. The potential effects, and this hasn't been correlated or shown in humans, I want to point that out, but in other experiments in the laboratory, both in cells and maybe in animal models, there's evidence for increases in inflammation, increases in oxidative stress, evidence for reproductive effects, and some evidence for neurotoxicity. Although I have to point that it's only been demonstrated in experimental studies, and those haven't been correlated or reported with strong evidence in humans. I personally think to myself, well, if it's choice of plastic or no plastic, I'd rather go no plastic. But is that rational? This is a case where it is actually what the individual needs and is able to do. Is it rational to eliminate all plastics and move? That would be very difficult. This is not a issue that we can life choice or even shop our way out of. But there are things that you can do to reduce your plastic exposure. How we dispose of these plastics, how we recycle these plastics, and how we use these plastics is now being really, really studied. The overall adverse impact effects on human health have yet to be determined. And we don't know the extent of that, if any. But it is clear, though, that we know for one thing that the effects of plastics on the environment um, is something that we should be able to address. So overall, I think you will see a push for decreased use of plastics, and I think that will be a push in the future. The bottom line is, while proof of harm is currently lacking, there is good reason to think sensibly about decreasing our exposure both for ourselves and our environment. Now, later today, my colleague Pam Osborne will go into things that you can do to reduce your everyday plastic exposure at home. Back to you.